Good morning and welcome to the ninth biennial Childhood Obesity Conference. Woohoo! All right. We're very pleased that you're here with us today and we have an action packed, fun filled agenda for over the next three days. My name is Jane Finley. I'm the Senior Vice President and Area Manager responsible for the Kaiser Foundation Hospital and Health Plan functions here in San Diego. And we're quite proud to uh, be sponsoring this conference and taking care of 609,000 San Diegans. That's, that deserves some applause. So one in five San Diegans with our two hospitals and 24 medical clinics. We're thrilled to host, as I said, this, this beautiful, this incredible conference in our beautiful sunny city. And we really hope you get a chance to enjoy it, to get out, walk along the beach, get on the trolley, check out some of the great sights of our beautiful city. This year's conference theme, Good Health for All, addressing equity where we live, learn, work, and play, challenges us to discuss the tough issues that contribute to health inequities while compelling us to work together to create equitable outcomes so that all children can attain their highest level of physical and mental health. Some of the content running throughout this conference requires us to confront systematic inequities that are unfair and unjust. These equities help us to identify needed changes to pursue in order to find our path forward to good health for all. We're very pleased to have two representatives from our host agencies on hand to share why the Childhood Obesity Conference is still one of the most important conferences addressing children's health and why their agendas are involved. First up is the California Department of Public Health's Deputy Director of the Office of Health Equity, Dr. William Jamal Miller. Appointed to this role by Governor Jerry Brown in 2013, Dr. Miller is the state's leading advisor on issues related to reducing health and mental health disparities and achieving health equity for all Californians. He is responsible for leading a mission to promote uh, equitable social, economic, and environmental conditions to achieve optimal health, mental health, and well-being for all. Dr. Miller's passion for working to achieve health equity comes from his background as a healthcare administrator in a pediatric treatment center where he witnessed firsthand the troubling health disparities children faced simply because of living conditions that were no fault of their own. You can visit page 30 in the conference program to continue learning Dr. Miller's story. But first, please join me in welcoming Dr. Miller. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. All right. Um, we need far more energy than that to really confront and dismantle um, this childhood obesity epidemic that has uh, overtaken and overrun our beautiful country as well as our beautiful state. So um, I am honored to just be able to provide some opening remarks on behalf of the California Department of Public Health, and I'm equally honored to, uh, to lead California's Office of Health Equity. And uh, it's truly humbling also to have our partners within the California Department of Public Health and Nutrition, Education, and Obesity Prevention branch that has played an instrumental role in facilitating uh, this convention and that um, we would have health equity um, at the core um, of uh, the conversation and the activities that we're going to engage in over the next few days. So to lead the state's charge and to know that there's a room of health equity ambassadors who are equally as committed as I am and my staff and the California Department of Public Health, um, to just know that we're all on the same path, charting the same course, to address these issues and these inequities that contribute to issues such as childhood obesity. That's very heartening, and I believe you should give yourselves a round of applause for the commitment you've made to do this work. So we know that um, there are a variety of determinants um, of equity that play a key role in our ability um, to mitigate and to address the childhood obesity epidemic. And at the end of the day, we know that issues such as economic security, income security, issues around poverty, racism, 
a variety of other institutional and corporate and policy oriented challenges continue to stand in the way. And that's why I'm really delighted that the focus on the social determinants of health and the role um, that they play beyond care and coverage and our ability to address childhood obesity is at the focus of the next few days of activity because it's all about the resources and having the capacity and the wherewithal to affect real sustainable change through empowerment, through politics, civic engagement, and securing and wielding real power. Um, one of the things I've been doing lately to show how inextricably linked and connected we are in this struggle um, to address inequities is I like to read from the Health and Safety Code that creates the Office of Health, e uh, Health Equity. Um, I like to read the definition for vulnerable communities. Oftentimes we have a huge misunderstanding in who's most vulnerable. And I wanna demonstrate to you as I come to a close um, who's truly vulnerable so that we not only have a professional role, an academic role in addressing these issues, but understanding that this is very personal with regard to who can be most vulnerable at any given time, who could be disadvantaged, who can be underserved or underrepresented. So I'm gonna take a few seconds to read this definition and if you happen to hear the group that you belong to, I would like for you to stand and or wave your hand or give a shout out because I wanna illustrate to you how committed we are and how connected we are to this important work. So the definition of vulnerable communities sounds like a game show. Vulnerable communities include, but are not limited to women, Stan, <laughs> racial or ethnic groups, low income individuals, yeah, <laughs> and families, individuals who are incarcerated and those who have been incarcerated, individuals with disabilities, remain standing please, individuals with mental health conditions, children, youth and young adults, seniors, immigrants and refugees, individuals who are limited English proficient and lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, questioning communities or combinations of these populations. So look around the room. If there is someone who is not standing, they happen to be committed to the cause of representing these communities and doing important work. So I would encourage them to stand and or raise your hands. But I wanna show you that we are truly linked to being the most vulnerable at any given time. This isn't work that is other, that we just send out for just folks like us just to do because we just happen to care about this, but we have to have deep skin in the game and demonstrate our commitment by not only coming to events like this to share our expertise and our knowledge, but to share a passion and to get a fire started and to generate the type of power that is required for us to change and transform our neighborhoods our communities, our state, and our country. And the unique disposition of childhood obesity in this country creates that opportunity for us. So I shared with Jesse this morning that I would come in under 10 minutes, and I hope that I have. But uh, once again, welcome. Truly glad to be engaged with you in this journey and in this work. And um, achieving health equity is not aspirational for me. I believe that we are realizing that now in the face of daunting statistics. So let's be about that business of closing these disparities, closing these unfair, systemic, and preventable gaps that are disproportionately impacting many of our children across this country and across the state of California. So let's step up, let's meet the challenge, let's generate and empower ourselves, and let's, let's, get it, let's make it happen. Thank you. that that uh, health and safety code could be so invigorating first thing in the morning, right? <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Miller. Our next speaker is Dr. Lowell Solomon, Vice President of Community Health at Kaiser Permanente. In this role, Dr. Sol Solomon oversees the design, execution, and evaluation of our community-based programs and leads efforts to ensure that our community benefit programs are responsive to evolving community health needs. He works closely with many partners within Kaiser Permanente, including myself and my team, 
uh, to develop and implement our strategy for addressing the social determinants of health, including our efforts to identify and address the social and non-medical needs of our members and the communities we serve. He is co-founder of the Convergence Partnership, a collaborative national uh, funders which advises policy and environmental approaches to community health and is a member of the Institute of Medicine's Roundtable on Obesity Solutions. It's my great pleasure to introduce Lowell to the stage. Good morning, everybody. It's uh, really great to be here, and thanks for the introduction, Jane, for emceeing us throughout the day. Um, Kaiser Permanente is indeed uh, proud to be a, uh, a sponsor of this meeting, as we have since the very beginning, and we're a sponsor of this meeting because it's simply the best obesity conference in the country, um, and it's a really special one uh, because it really brings together people that our advocates, people that are on the front lines, either as clinicians or as uh, public health practitioners, uh, researchers, policymakers, all of us that have a, a piece of the puzzle that we need to bring together to solve the, uh, solve the epidemic. Um, I uh, wanted to spend my few moments with you this morning uh, to uh, place us a little bit in, 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 in time and reflect on where we are uh, in the epidemic, what some of the successes are and what some of the challenges are that lay before us uh, to set the stage for a really tremendous panel that's going to get us into a really important discussion about uh, the, the, the politics that we're confronting now. Um, so to start us off with, um, we have a lot to celebrate. Firstly, we now know what works. We know that changing environments works, addressing the settings where people live, work, and uh, go to school works multi-sector, multi-level, multi-component interventions work, engaging communities in the solutions uh, uh, is, is necessary and really works. Secondly, we've had some really amazing policy successes that many of you in this room have worked tirelessly for. We have the Healthy Hungry Free Kids Act, which sets a very high standard for school lunches. Um, we have the Every Student Succeeds Act, which re-injects health into accountability standards and planning for schools, which is a really big thing. And if I was to recount the successes that we've had at the state and local level, I'd be here for a week. Um, so amazing policy successes. Uh, thirdly, we are seeing the market shift. For the first time um, that we, uh, for the first time ever, uh, last year, we saw the sale of water exceed the sale of sodas. Um, and that is a major, major accomplishment. Thank you, CSPI and, 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 and others that, uh, that, that did that uh, important work. Um, and when the food and beverage industry starts putting their marketing dollars in back of those products, then we know that we'll really be cooking with, uh, with gas. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, we see childhood obesity rates starting to level out and we're seeing declines for uh, preschool children, largely through uh, fabulous work that Nemours and others that are uh, here today uh, have put into uh, making the early childhood environment um, healthier. Um, so all that is exceptionally good. Um, there's another hand, right? <laughs> on the other hand, like Fiddler on the Roof, on one hand, on the other hand, um, there are some very serious headwinds that we're, we're sailing into, uh, and I know this panel is going to get into those in, uh, in, in, in gory relief. Um, on the policy front, we start, started to see some weakening of those uh, uh, school lunch uh, standards, um, and if that's the sign of things to come, it's really worrisome. We see a federal budget uh, proposal that would devastate public health spending, it would devastate food stamps. Uh, it would undermine uh, uh, funding for schools and pretty much everything that we care about. Um, and also, we have um, really major threats to the Affordable Care Act that many of us have worked really hard to, uh, to, to come into being, um, which would challenge our ability to prevent and treat obesity for kids and families. Um, so very significant policy threats. Beyond the policy threats, I uh, see a very significant challenge to us sustaining our focus and our energy on an epidemic that is um, entering its fourth decade, really. Um, and that's natural. 
when you are in a struggle for a long time, it's natural for the media, for philanthropy, for public opinion to get a little weary, to get a little unstable, to get uh, a little unfocused, to want to see the next thing happen. Um, and I just want to say that arresting childhood obesity rates at 70 percent, 17 percent, is not victory. Staying where we are is not victory. Um, we know that we have to move forward um, and move that, uh, that rate down. Um, I, many of you in this room will remember uh, in 2005 when that JAMA article came out that um, projected out into the future and made the uh, apocryphal statement that this will be the first generation in known history to have, of kids that have, would have a life expectancy lower than their parents. That took us all, um, it took the breath away for, for, for many of us uh, when that first came out. Um, we don't talk about that study very much anymore, but the basic assumptions that went into that forecast are still as present today as they were in, in 2005. So we have serious, serious work to do. So what to do moving forward? Um, as uh, Jane mentioned in my uh, introduction, um, uh, I'm fortunate to work with a really amazing group of, of partners called the Convergence Partnership. Um, and after the election, we got together, tried to surveil the landscape and figure out what the heck to do. Um, and we came up with uh, uh, four actions uh, that we uh, wanted to use to chart our, our steps forward. And I think those action steps are as relevant for this group as, as they are for that group of uh, uh, convergence partners. And we came up with four major actions. We wanted to defend, we wanted to persist, we wanted to advance, and we wanted to innovate. So how does that apply to us? Firstly, we need to defend. There is a ton at stake. I mentioned some of the policy challenges. Um, we need to defend our progress on healthy school lunches, uh, on food stamps, on access to care and coverage for people that are depending on us. Persistence. We need to continue to advocate for what we know works to make the healthy choice the easy choice. And we need to vigorously resist obesity prevention fatigue. We have to finish the job. Thirdly, we need to uh, advance our work. We need to build on the really tremendous progress we're seeing for the very youngest children and make sure that when those preschool kids enter elementary school, that elementary school doesn't undo all the great progress that we've made. Um, and, uh, and, and importantly, on the topic of health equity, um, we know that obesity rates are too high for uh, all of our kids. They're even higher for Latino kids and for African-American kids. We absolutely have to close the, uh, the, the equity gap. Finally, we need to innovate. We can't become stale. We need to keep on learning together and evolve our strategies to integrate this knowledge into practice. And one area that I wanted to call out this morning in the few minutes that I have left is the need, the opportunity to connect um, obesity and obesity prevention with social emotional health and wellness. We are sitting here in San Diego, which is the birthplace of the Adverse Childhood Experience Study, which was done uh, about 20 years ago by uh, a physician at Kaiser Permanente uh, in San Diego in Jane's service area, um, and another colleague at the Centers for Disease Control. Um, many of you might know the, the story about ACEs, um, but in short, um, Dr. Folletti and Dr. Anda found a dose response between the uh, amount of adversity people experienced in childhood and obesity, a dose response that is really stark. Um, further studies went on to find out that people that had been uh, uh, exposed to large amounts of adversity as a kid have a, a, a two-fold increase in the chances of having heart disease and cancer, a seven-fold increase uh, in the chances of being an alcoholic, a 12-fold increase in suicidality, on and on and on, the relationship between adversity in early childhood and social-emotional health challenges in childhood and later chronic health problems is just enormous. So the implications for us, we need to connect the dots between healthy eating, active living, and obesity, and, uh, and, and adverse childhood experience. We need to intervene with families who are at risk of adversity early on to prevent people from having those experiences, to prevent obesity. And of course, the treatment recommendations uh, that pediatricians use who are treating kids that have uh, adverse childhood experience is healthy eating, sleep, physical activity, a lot of behavioral health supports, but there is a huge connection between ACEs, adversity, 
building resilience and obesity that we gotta we gotta connect that if we're gonna uh, succeed in this work uh, moving forward and close the equity gap that uh, Jamal uh, called us uh, called us uh, to uh, to focus on. Um, my colleagues at Kaiser Permanente are thinking about the connection of. ACEs and trauma-informed schools as part of the healthy schools work that we do, trying to figure out what the unique role is that teachers and adults in the school environment can play at creating a nurturing environment, identifying kids that are at risk or are experiencing adversity, connecting them to the right resources, and, uh, and really creating a, a positive environment uh, for them moving forward. So. Um, that's one example of the kind of innovation that we need to do to connect uh, social emotional wellness and, and obesity prevention that uh, I'm encouraging us to think about. Um, so we uh, have a lot of work to do. As you enter this conference, I want you to consider what you need, what connections you need, um, what you need to recharge your batteries, what you need to learn in order to uh, do those things, to persist, to defend, to advance and to innovate. Um, this is the conference to do it. Um, so with that, I wanted to uh, introduce uh, the moderator for the next panel, uh, Margot Wutan from the Center for Science uh, uh, and the Public Interest, who uh, is a true hero, um, a person of incredible integrity, um, who has done more for obesity prevention um, as much as, or if not more than, than, than anybody, um, and we're really uh, glad to have her with us. I'm gonna read her formal uh, bio blurb so I get the facts down. Uh, Margot Wutan is the Nutrition Policy Director at the Center for Science and the Public Interest, uh, which was named as the top-ranked nonprofit for National Children's Health uh, and Nutrition. Um, Margot received her uh, bachelor's degree in nutrition from Cornell, her doctorate in nutrition from Harvard, um, she has coordinated efforts to uh, address many of those policy issues that I was referring to a moment before. Um, she has uh, coordinated led efforts to require calorie labeling in restaurants, currently on hold, um, requiring trans fat labeling on packaged foods, uh, improving school foods and reducing junk uh, food marketing to children. Uh, she is regularly quoted in the national media um, and you might have seen her in Super Size Me and Fed Up. Uh, we owe a debt of gratitude to Margot um, and uh, CSPI for their great, great work. And at this point, I would like to invite Margot up to introduce the panel. Thank you. Well, I'm always excited to be here at the Childhood Obesity Conference. It's so great to get in a room with so many committed public health champions and quite frankly to get out of Washington for a little bit. Um, so I'm going to start before we get to the meat of this session. I'm going to run through the nifty conference app and I actually I brought my phone up here. And so um, they really have some terrific features that will help us to stay connected and engaged over the next couple of days, which is a key theme of the conference and the major theme of this session. So how many of you already have downloaded the app? Oh my goodness, I don't even need to go through this, but <laughs> good job. So if you haven't, go to your favorite app store and just search for Childhood Obesity Conference and it comes right up. Or you could try to find the email you know, that they sent you to, but it's really easy to find on the app store. And so it has a bunch of different features. Um, it connects you to all things related to the conference. There are, um, you can connect with other attendees. You can create your own conference agenda. You can find what room you wanna go to. Um, and there are some polling features that some of the sessions will use as well. And so the other thing is, oh, can I just go back one? Um, it also pulls in the social media. So we can stay connected through Twitter, through Instagram, through the conference, and you can go to the social media feed. And if you tweet, use the hashtag um, COC17. I can, I gotta move over a little so I can see my own slides here. Um, and you can, um, see what other people are saying about other sessions that you're not in or connect with other people um, in your session. 
So I am going to introduce the panel. Um, it's, uh, it's, as I said, good to be outside of DC. I both live and work in Washington, DC. And as you may have heard, um, I have a new neighbor at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. And um, he has changed the tone and tenor of the town and, um, and of our work um, at the Center for Science and the Public Interest and just generally in public health policy around progressive issues. Um, the anti-regulatory alternative facts let business do as it pleases rhetoric from the campaign has translated into what the administration is focusing on. Not surprisingly, some people seem to think that what he said in the campaign wasn't going to be what he would do when he got to Washington, but um, we have seen that um, he is not into government solutions. He very much puts the interests of business ahead of the interests of the public. So. During the campaign, there was a lot of anti-government rhetoric, and there was a position paper where the president-to-be said that he wanted to reform the entire regulatory system and have not only a moratorium on regulations, but repeal 75% of the regulations that are on the books. And, you know, maybe outside of Washington, maybe to people outside of public health or progressive issues, regulation is a bad word, but regulation is basically the workings of agencies. It's healthier school nutrition, healthier school lunches. It's the new standards for the child and adult care food program helping to provide healthier food to preschool age children. It's keeping the environment safe. It's addressing public health in so many different ways. But he says he would like to keep regulatory costs to zero. That means also that for every new regulation that's adopted, two will have to be repealed and that there can't be any increase in government costs at all. So anything from keeping our planes flying safely, to our water drinkable, to our food safe, are affected by these deregulatory issues. Um, but there's also many other things at risk. The Trump budget proposes deep cuts to SNAP, to Medicaid, to research at the National Institutes of Health, to chronic disease prevention and pr health promotion efforts at the Centers for Disease Control. Um, you heard about there's a one-year delay on menu labeling and probably even worse. During that year, the industry is going to be working very hard to weaken menu labeling so that it won't be as useful as available to customers in restaurants and supermarkets and in convenience stores. The administration has indicated a willingness to delay added sugars, labeling and updates to nutrition facts for up to three years. And there are plans to roll back the sodium, whole grain, and other nutrition standards for school lunch. And then Congress also has proposed some really scary stuff. And the House has actually passed a number of bills that, um, that would affect public health. One is the little known Regulatory Accountability Act, which would fundamentally change the working of agencies, making it near impossible for them to adopt any new agency initiatives. So we are going to hear about this and more, and we're going to talk about some ways to respond. Um, we have a terrific panel who is going to recap the policy challenges that we're facing. And then even more importantly, we're going to talk about how to deal with them um, for children, for low-income families, for at-risk and vulnerable communities. We're going to talk about how to frame our messages and how to disseminate them and actions in more effective ways. So first we're going to hear from Michael Jacobson, the co-founder and president of the Center for Science in the Public Interest. Then we're going to hear from Veva Isles from Cultiva La Salud, and then from Lori Dorfman from Berkeley Media Studies. And then she will be followed by Quinn Chazen from Google and from Diana Colasurdo 
from Twitter. So Mike, why don't you kick us off? Thank you very much, Margo, and thank you to the California Department of Public Health for organizing the conference and for inviting me to speak. Uh, it's really wonderful to be here. Um, first, I should start out by telling you some secrets you might not know about Margot and me. We come from Washington, D.C., but we believe in science. <laughs> And we don't believe that people are born with a finite amount of energy that is dissipated by exercise, as a certain pumpkin-haired president <laughs> believes. And I should apologize in advance. I am going to be highly partisan. I think the times deserve that. So. <laughs> I'm going to have some good news and some dire news, some of which you've heard already from Margo and Dr. Solomon. Uh, but first, there's been all the, the, there has been a lot of progress over the past decade or so. And a bottom line is that childhood obesity rates for the preschool kids, the rates have leveled off and have begun to decline by about 20%. And that is really a remarkable achievement when you think of how obesity is baked in to our culture. And I think we should give due credit to Michelle Obama, uh, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, <laughs> the, the California Endowment, USDA officials who worked very hard to implement the improved WIC standards and school meal standards, and to all of you who are doing such wonderful things at a small scale or a big scale, at the local level or the national level, or with individual clients. So how about a round of applause for everybody who's made a difference. And there's been progress on, on, on other fronts. The, the, um, Margot has mentioned school meals have more fruits and vegetables and, and whole grains and less salt and saturated fat. Candy and soft drinks have been banned from schools. What a remarkable change. You know, I remember going to school, you know, a long time ago, and there were vending machines selling junk, and nobody thought a moment about it. It's just, you know, that's, that's life. Uh, sales of regular soda pop have declined by 25% per capita in the last 17 years. You know, soda was just, you know, again, part of our culture. It's just everywhere. It's the norm. But that's been changing. Sales of Coca-Cola have declined by 36% per capita. Sales of Pepsi have declined 56% per capita. And I'd call for a round of applause for the soda companies <laughs> if they were doing that intentionally. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, they're doing everything they can not to, not to lose their sales. Farmers markets. Community gardens, home gardens, have been sprouting in every corner of the country. The Food and Drug Administration banned trans fat, partially hydrogenated oil. That is saving thousands of lives invisibly, helping everybody, Democrats and Republicans alike. And companies, and, and you know who deserves credit for it? You know, Margo started it with petitioning the FDA for labeling of trans fat back in 1993. And, and that evolved to, um, our, we proposed a ban on trans fat in 2004. And there, the whole food chain deserves huge credit from the consumers, supermarkets, food manufacturers, 
oil processors, seed developers, and farmers, a long chain that has replaced almost 8 billion pounds a year of partially hydrogenated oil. Really an enormous achievement for industry stimulated by consumers with a foundation of scientific research and that's how things change and government finally endorsing that shows the value of public health action and companies are slowly very slowly beginning to tackle the number one problem in restaurant foods and processed foods high sodium levels if we could cut sodium consumption in half, that would save 100,000 lives a year. Again, Democrats and Republicans and everybody in between. That's something that needs a lot more work. And more, much more broadly, to use the words of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, America is gradually building a culture of health. And that's starting especially in California, and maybe eventually it will creep back to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Let's hope that that's the case. But as Margot and Dr. Solomon have mentioned, some of that progress is being threatened by a radical president and a radical Congress, both of which are trying to shrink government while they fatten the plutocrats. And we can't let that happen. They have postponed the improvements to school meals. And that's something both Trump and Congress have uh, conspired to do. Do I hear any boos for that? <laughs> and how about at the behest of the supermarket industry, the pizza industry, and the convenience store industry, they derailed, once again, menu labeling. And the administration is threatening to postpone for at least three years the new nutrition facts labels. And why do they want to do it? because of that line for added sugars. They're embarrassed. They don't want to disclose that some of their products contain more than a whole day's worth of added sugars. Um, but the, they have the power now, but we're going to stop them wherever we can. And the president's budget, which is as dead as many of the president's promises, calls, calls for catastrophic decreases in the budgets of the EPA the uh, Occupational Safety and Health Administration, food stamps, uh, SNAP, um, National Institutes of Health. You know, it's just crazy. It's literally crazy to cut those budgets and um, it saves some money in the short run, but it's devastating to the public's welfare in the longer run. I think that budget is, is totally dead. Republican senators have said the same thing, but it sets down a marker, and Republicans in Congress will try to push for a budget that isn't quite as draconian, but moves in the direction of cuts rather than investments, which is what we need and which America can afford. Diet and health are a small part of the government, and Radical conservatives have their eyes set on much bigger targets. They're gunning for what they call the deconstruction of the administrative state. And what that means in English is eliminating protection for, for consumers and workers, for women and minorities, and giving big business free reign to rake in the bucks. And the, the uh, two classic examples are that uh, two-for-one regulatory requirement, get rid of two regulations for every new regulation, and the ones you get rid of have to be of equal cost to government. Never mind the benefits. Never mind the benefits. Those don't count in 
the administration's met, uh, metrics. Uh, Public Citizen and other groups have sued the administration to stop that from, being, from going into effect. And the House of Representatives and a Senate committee have passed the Regulatory Accountability Act, which would throw so much red tape into the regulatory process that you can kiss goodbye to any new health, environmental, or civil rights protections. It is so antithetical to the American traditions, American values, that you'd think that either Voldemort or Vladimir wrote those <laughs> regulations, wrote that legislation. So, well, that's all grim news. I do have one additional morsel of good news, and that is there are only about 1,330 days till the next inauguration day. It's something to look forward to. So in those three and a half years, we've got to do everything we can to pre prevent the backsliding at the national level and to make progress at the local level. We've all got to speak up, especially if you have Republican senators or members of Congress uh, who are representing you or purporting to represent you. We've got to stop these actions that the administration is undertaking that are illegal at the national level. And uh, we're exploring a lawsuit on the school lunch uh, regulations, the, the, uh, um, the postponing of the, the improvements. And just to show that we're not totally partisan, uh, about 10 days ago, we sued the Food and Drug Administration for what we believe are illegal actions that maintain loose re regulations governing food additives. And that's an Obama uh, era regulation. So we, we, we hope we can stop that one. But the federal government is out to lunch. State and local governments have to fill in. And you can play a particularly important role in getting that accomplished by being active at the local level. And that's where a lot of things happen. School lunch improvements, trans fat labeling at restaurants and, and bakeries. Um, New York City has required salt shaker icons on the saltiest dishes at, uh, at restaurants, on the, on the menus and menu boards. And uh, groups like public health advocates in California and many groups around the country are <laughs> are uh, just champions at getting state and local action. And finally, we can't be complacent about childhood obesity. You know, that even though there's a 20% reduction, young children are still, the prevalence of obesity is almost twice as great as it was in the 1970s. Um, and the rate of extreme obesity in youths, preschool and teenagers alike, is twice as great as it was 30 years ago. So we have a lot to do on that front. And then the racial uh, differences compared to white youths, uh, black youths are 30% uh, prevalences of, of obesity is 30% greater among Lat Latinos, 50% greater. And of course, Asian Americans make us all look fat. Uh, and, but they're doing their job in trying to promote self, uh, social uh, 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 equity by eating more. And I think we have to watch the Asian American rates so that they don't achieve uh, equity with whites and, and then others. So we're facing some real headwinds and the challenges ahead are great, but I'm optimistic because the scientific evidence for what we're fighting for is so strong and people like you are so passionate for, about improving the public's health, that we're going to make progress. And I hope that this conference re-energizes us all and we reach a new fever pitch of activism, stop the bad stuff, and win the new stuff. Make the progress. Thank you so much.
Buenos dias. Good. So I want to begin uh, by, uh, good, I got my slides up, uh, by thanking um, Dr. Miller because I, I wanted to explain this idea of vulnerable populations really being all of us, and I think his exercise really helped us um, understand that that at some point in our lives, in our times, in our age, we're going to be those vulnerable populations. I also want to thank the conference organizers um, for inviting me to join the panel. I'm, I'm not a researcher. My career in childhood obesity prevention has been centered at the intersection of uh, public health and, and public policies. I'm a public health advocate who's interested in advancing health equity. I'm also a Latina of Mexican heritage. So I, again, un saludo a todos mis Latinos. ¿Dónde estamos? I hear you. Um, I'm also a child of farm laborers who grew up in poverty in California's Central Valley. So I want to do a shout out to all my Central Valley homies in the house. All right, I hear you too. Um, so it's really from this perspective, as a public health advocate, a Latina, and a child of poverty that I want to um, join uh, on this panel. And I, I want to talk about narratives and um, how <clears throat> narratives about communities are used to justify revoking protections and what that means in terms of the impact to those populations and, and well, to all of us. We've heard um, these narratives, um, people are lazy, poor people are lazy, uh, Mexicans just want to come here to have their babies, uh, people on SNAP are just gaming the system. Uh, I could go on and I'm sure that you probably can think of more. Um, so how do we change those narratives? So this is my, oops, can I go back one? I think I went up too far, there we go. Uh, this is my nuclear family. My mother and father met at a dance at the Rainbow Ballroom in Fresno in the late 1950s. It was one of the few locations that allowed, uh, that actually played Spanish music and allowed Mexican immigrants to dance. My mother, Elena, is a fantastic cook and she's a great seamstress, but she spent most of her life as a farm laborer. My father, Roberto, was also a farm laborer, and he eventually transitioned to becoming a farm equipment mechanic. My father pulled off the side of the road every time he seen somebody broken down because he felt as a mechanic he could help, but more importantly, because he felt it was his responsibility to help. He's not the bad hombres that you've heard about before. He's the type of person that you actually want to be your neighbor and that we want in the fabric of our communities. My dad also used to love to tell jokes, none of which I can repeat publicly. <laughs> My sister Magdalena graduated with an AA in criminology, but before she could holster a gun, uh, she fell in love and got married and became a stay-at-home mom who sewed her children's Halloween costumes. My brother Francisco, AKA Pancho, uh, was a US Marine and um, he, like my dad, became a mechanic, except he works for Rolls-Royce on their airplanes. And my younger brother, Victor, um, he works for Johnson & Johnson in uh, Sacramento. And really, as the baby of our family, I have nothing good to say about him, um, <laughs> except for maybe that he was a Trekkie. And then there's me, you know, squarely in the middle, not the oldest daughter, not the oldest son, not the baby of the family. So this explains a lot about why I'm crazy. Um, <laughs> but I'm the former Cinco de Mayo queen who began my career in public health, teaching people how to put on condoms. And now I work with people about how to advocate for healthy communities. My parents' combined income when I applied to college in 1986 was $18,000. We were without question poor. And I'm thankful for those free and reduced price lunches that fed me every day. I'm thankful for the Medi-Cal that allowed me and my family to access health care.
My family was without question a very typical farm working family that you find in places like California's Central Valley or maybe the Salinas Valley or the Coachella Valley. Um, we are Americans. My family on the 4th of July <clears throat> perhaps did not bake apple pies. We rolled tamales and we set off fireworks. I share this about my family because um, it's probably not the stories that you've heard, right? It's um, definitely not the stories we've been hearing about Mexican immigrants. My family is of Mexican origin, but we're not drug dealers, we're not criminals, and we're certainly not rapists. And when my parents came from Mexico, Mexico did send its best. It's exactly these negative narratives that removes the humanity from people and fuels hate, bigotry, and racism. Negative messages about vulnerable populations diminishes their worth and establish the rationale about them being undeserving. Undeserving for food, undeserving for health care, and undeserving of assistance. Seventy percent of adults in the Central Valley are overweight or obese. One out of every three children are overweight or obese. And since 2010, half of all Latino, Latino children born will develop diabetes in their lifetime. This is unacceptable. Thank you, Marco. <laughs> that makes a big difference. Thank you. <laughs> um, my people, my community, live in communities where there isn't often potable water fueling their consumption of sugary drinks. Um, they're living in food deserts despite picking the fruits and vegetables that keep us healthy and feed our nation. Uh, they're in communities with no parks, no sidewalks, no street lights. Their green spaces in the communities are often locked after school hours, so there are no places to be physically active and recreate. So it's it's not um, unfathomable to believe why we have such a high obesity rate. Um, but we have to understand that they also can't change the things alone. And that's why it's so important for us to work, to continue to work so that we can create a different future for the lives of these children. Like my family, there are hundreds of other hardworking families struggling to make ends meet, but willing to struggle because of their dream for better lives for their children. Children who will serve and defend this country like my brothers. Children who would advocate for the disadvantaged like myself and my sister. Children who will eventually nurse you when you're sick. Children who will engineer and construct our buildings and our roads. And children who will dance and sing as our next generation of entertainers. Every time we sit at a table to enjoy the fruits and grains and vegetables from our good earth, remember that they come from the work of men, women, and children who have been exploited for generations. Those are the words of Cesar Chavez, the co-founder of the United Farm Workers, and this is the plight of my people. <clears throat> and what does my community uh, get uh, in thanks for uh, their hard work and, and their production, less than nothing. The anti-immigrant vitriol that has been perpetuated by our current federal administration has my community in fear. In LA, some immigrants who are eligible for food assistance programs are staying away because they fear enrollment will hurt their chances of becoming permanent US citizens or even lead to deportation. The same thing is happening in San Francisco and in Fresno and other places throughout California and our nation. It is no surprise to me to see protections for vulnerable populations being revoked because our language is depreciating our worth. You'll never hear the story of Leti Perez, a Mexican immigrant who works in Parlier with learning challenge children who makes peanut butter and jelly sandwiches to feed the homeless. Sorry. Here's another part of the story you'll likely never hear. 
Most households that receive SNAP are headed by a white, non-Hispanic. Most SNAP recipients are white. Over half the SNAP recipients are children and elderly, not lazy, able-bodied adults. The overwhelming majority of SNAP recipients are U.S. born, not hordes of illegal immigrants looking to come and benefit off of government programs. Our administration is cutting the budgets for needed programs for us. Budgets are statements of our values, and here's what our budget is saying. <clears throat> We're going to cut Medicaid by 47 percent. I'm sorry. Can I go? I can't go back on this one. I went too far forward. One more. Okay, there we go. Um, so we thank you for that. <laughs> so we're um, cutting Medicaid by 47 percent. We're cutting um, SNAP by 25 percent over the next 10 years. We're going to cut earned income tax credit and child tax credit over 10 years. We're going to um, cut programs like uh, temporary assistance for needy families by 13 percent over 10 years. And there's going to be huge cuts in federal agencies that provide a lot of support, like the EPA, like HUD, like Health and Human Services. So moving quickly. So what does is, what is the loss of these policy strides mean for vulnerable populations? It means that people won't get the health care that they need. It means that our safety net will become vulnerable, that our waiting rooms will revert back to being overburdened, and it means that you, I, and our families will eventually be affected by a weakened health care system. It means that people will go hungry because they'll be kicked off of the system. It means that our food banks will be taxed by people who have nowhere else to go, and it means that you and I and our families will eventually be affected by people who are taking more drastic measures because they are hungry. It will mean that people will go without services they will need for fear of de deportation. It means that people we know will suffer. It means that you and I and our families will also eventually be affected by a society that does not see the worth of us all. <clears throat> so what do we do? Well, we have to counter those negative narratives. And by countering, I mean tweet, I mean Facebook posts, anywhere else that you can get your message. There should be no ban, there should be no wall, and there should definitely be no more cuts to vulnerable populations. <clears throat> and a colleague once shared with me the importance of understanding the spiral of silence and that we should not be silent in our opposition. We need to tell the, our stories. We need to lift up those stories of triumph and inspiration, just like Leti's story. And if we're thinking about hashtags, here's one. Eat more fruits and vegetables and thank a farm worker. We need um, to use our voice and our vote. Now more than ever, we need to rise to the mission of the public health of the mission of us in public health to protect and serve our communities. We need to continue to invest in building community leadership. Community residents are the experts of their communities and we should support them in speaking their truth to power as well as moving interventions that are relevant to them. We need public health champions in elected offices, and this might mean that we work to educate and inform those who are currently serving, but it might also mean that we begin to identify within our public health community champions and ask them to run and help them to win. We must continue to, um, we must continue to insist on resources and funding to support our work, and we must persist in those efforts. We must resist our opposition, and we must never, never desist. So I ran out of time, and I really want to thank you. Thank you, Vetva.
Thank you, Margo, and thank you, Mike, and in advance. Thank you, Ken and <laughs> Diana. Um, this is quite a view up here. It's really nice to see you all from this vantage point. I've, I've been at that vantage point, but not this one. And it really reinforces the core message we've been hearing so far that we're in this together and we need each other to accomplish it. So thank you very much for this opportunity to get this view of you all from up here. I'm going to talk about framing a little bit. That's what I've been asked to talk about so we can understand a little bit behind the narratives that Veva just described and why they're so difficult to counter. On the one hand, they're difficult to counter, it seems, because of the onslaught and the political circumstances we're in now. On the other hand, Veva did a pretty good job correcting that narrative. So it is absolutely something we can do. We do have a difficult starting point. Uh, green button, ah, green button, okay. Here's, here's the starting point we're in. This is a New Yorker cover that arrived on my doorstep some time ago, and I had to save it because I could see from this picture that this is how the rest of the world views public health. You can see the New York Health Department here in this picture has put people in stocks for smoking, salt, for eating too many carbs. Of course, you can tell how old this is because nobody talks about carbs anymore, right? But <laughs> But this is, this is a typical starting point. People don't come to the issue of childhood health or obesity or public health empty. They come with pictures already in their heads. And one of the pictures about us is that we are scolds. We are telling people what not to do. And this goes right in line with a very strong underlying narrative that you all know in America that, if, that it's called rugged individualism. You've heard the idea if you pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you can get ahead. And on the one hand, that's a terrific story. That's why some Mexican immigrants came to the United States, because here is where if you try hard, you can succeed and you are rewarded. But the narrative has become troubling and difficult because it has narrowed to the point that we can't see the whole picture. So that's one problem I'm going to talk about. But what has narrowed is that we can't see the environment as well. And the environment these days makes it very, very hard to counter. So I'm showing you a picture now that my friend Leslie Mickelson from Prevention Institute took. When she was going through SeaTac, the airport in Seattle, and wanted to get a drink of water. And some people, when they see this, don't even notice the water fountain and the filling station at the bottom where we could fill our water bottles. That's a big achievement for public health. When the message is so loud from the industry that says, mmm, you deserve better than water. This is a very, very hard message environment to compete in. So we have these two things going on at once. We have serious rugged individualism. We have an onslaught of messages from people with something to sell that are going to make people sick. So this is tough. So let me show you how this works a little bit. I want to show you just the fact that I want to illustrate how you already have things in your head that help you navigate the message environment. So tell me what it says behind the orange box. Oh, say it loud, say it proud. Okay, yeah, there we go. Except, you know, not so much. Oh, my goodness. Look what happened. I'm, I don't know how to go backwards up here. Can you put the slide backward one for me? So look what your brains did. They took a tiny little cue and they filled in the rest of the word. You didn't have to say brain, fill that in. It just happened. And the same thing happens with stories. You see a little bit of a picture, you see a little bit of a narrative, and your brain fills in what's already there. And when it comes to obesity, we have essentially two stories that our brain fills in. The first one is called, you are what you eat. And we all know that story. I don't really have to explain it to you. That's a story that says you're responsible for your health, or if you're a parent, you're responsible for your kid's health. If you want to improve health, you better make better choices. If parents are going to improve children's health, they have to instill good eating habits so the children make good choice. They have to exercise, and they have to exercise willpower. And all of that's true, and there's nothing wrong with it. 
except it's only part of the story. So that's where we come in, where we have to tell a bit of a different story. The other part of the story, Lowell already referred to, it's about the environment. And fortunately, he told us that when we change the environment, we can have progress. We have to change marketing in people's neighborhoods. We have to make sure that people don't live where there aren't sidewalks or parks to play or places where they can exercise. And that we have an, a society that allows parents to have enough time to shop and prepare meals at home. So the environment matters. And there's a different name for this story. This story is called What Surrounds Us Shapes Us. This is a story that requires some personal responsibility, but it also requires responsibility at high places. It requires responsibility from our lawmakers. And that's going to pay off because we know the environment works. And the environmental story, however, is a much more complicated story to tell. I want to thank my friends at Prevention Institute for this picture, too. This picture might refer back to what I told you before about these competing messages and the message environment we have to contend with. At the top, we have a message from our State Department of Public Health that is telling us not to take obesity lightly, that can barely compete with the happy face of the happy meal from McDonald's below saying that you can have a fun, tasty, affordable meal. But this isn't the reason I show you this picture. The reason I show you this picture is because I want you to look behind the billboards. And sure, this is a city street in Oakland. We're in an urban environment. There's a mom and pop restaurant there, but look behind. And what you'll see is a balcony and doors. This is an apartment building. There are neighborhoods where people have marketing on the sides of their homes. This is an equity issue. This is not solved by telling people to take more responsibility. We cannot hold people responsible for things they do not create. In fact, we have to take responsibility. It's not surprising that when the Rudd Center interviewed African American and Latino families, they said, yes, we have big obstacles to healthy, creating a health for our family and families and children. They have 13 times the density of outdoor advertising in those neighborhoods in neighborhoods dominated by African Americans and Latinos. There's a lot we have to fix, and there's a lot about fairness we have to talk about if we want to make this narrative visible. And that means it's up to us to help parents. We can't just hand them this problem. We have to talk about it in a way that makes sense to people. We have to do the kind of organizing and community work that gives us the opportunity to get the message out. And the message, um, even though the, the message is important, it's not the starting point. I show you this picture because it's way more than reciting just a clever message. This is a message from the, uh, the first community in the United States of America to have a soda tax, Berkeley, California. <laughs> Hooray, Berkeley. I should say also with the Navajo Nation, which also did it at the same time. And what, what they learned in Berkeley was that it was a always going to be more than a message. It was called Berkeley versus Big Soda. That was part of the message. But they did their community organizing. They had clarity about their solution. They knew who they wanted to engage, and they engaged it. They had leadership in a diverse coalition. That took a lot of work. You know, they fought a little, like most groups do. But they came together, and they came together around their values and the, and the message of their values, which was about children's health. That's what they hammered home. They used social media. They used all the typical things you might use to get out the message, but they went door to door. They shared the facts. They said what mattered to them, and they explained that this is way more than a landscape. I mean, this is way more than a portrait. This is a landscape. Any place, any starting point for the people in this room is going to be one singular po point on this landscape. And what our job is is to connect the landscape to the portrait. So people understand that the obesity epidemic and the health problem we're trying to solve is connected to one another. It's all those hubs, little hubs, where people are working on exercise or whether they're working on food or whether they're working on policy, whatever it is, it's connected together. And Dr. Miller, when he came up here, gave us a great opportunity. He said, obesity creates an opportunity for connection. 
It's interconnection that's the hard part of the story to tell. It's the part of the story that matters. We can tell that story when we tell the story of our families, when we say why we're doing this, when we say why we're here. We have to make the investment in health tangible. And the, you know, when we come in this room together, we have come here because we all care about the same thing. So it's not so much the problem here, it's when we go out and when we're talking to people who aren't in this room, that we have to explain why health matters, why health matters to us, and why it's not, why what we're doing isn't just about children growing up healthy, it's about growing a healthy society. And I know that is big, and I know it's daunting, but you know, I know we have done big and daunting things before. The reason I know that is because when public health advocates and UCLA did a study on how much soda kids drink, and I was reading about the study in the San Diego Union Tribune, I saw this picture. And when I saw this picture of an adorable child looking up lovingly, waiting for his mom, the caption said he was waiting for his mom to get some change so he could get some soda out of the vending machine, it reminded me of this picture. And oh, it's my dramatic big, fish, big finish and my picture isn't coming up. Will you guys put my next slide up? There it is. Okay. I'm pretty sure if we work at it, we can make that picture on the left look as strange to us as that picture on the right. So thank you all very much. Okay, sweet. Thank you again, um, everybody, for having me today. I really, really, really do appreciate it. This is my first conference, and it's already been a treat with these panelists. Um, we've heard a lot today about the what's and the and like how to create the policy. And Dan and he, I are here largely to talk about the how and the when um, in order to execute the things that we all um, are here to promote. And, and so I am Quinn Chazen. I am here on behalf of Google. I work in Washington, D.C. with the Department of Health and Human Services on all behavior change outreach on Brown Public Health, and more recently with state health departments over the last year or so um, on similar initiatives uh, top, to, top to bottom. Uh, and what I'm going to focus on today really quickly is just harnessing intent, how the explosion of digital, mobile, has created an umpteen amount of data points and variables that really do need to factor into our campaigns in a way that they haven't in the past. To Quentin Tarantino this little bit, I'm gonna start from the, from the end and just show here in, in San Diego how um, the different groups that we're trying to reach out to are here, are available, are accessible at any given moment. And we really have an opportunity in the public health space to combat some of the negative messages that we've seen from other panelists in, in, in the industry with sort of a, a health positive message. Um, to give like a couple of data points and to flesh this out, you know, we check our phones 150 times a day. And I want to walk you through a quick day in the life uh, of me last week just to get a sense of, of how this stuff is collected and how we can use it to our best advantage. So last Thursday, I went on a morning run and it went fairly poorly. Uh, I blamed it on my shoes like any reasonable person. Um, <laughs> And so came and tried to buy those. Uh, on my way to work, checking the metro construction for the people who live in DC, uh, it's not working, and so this is something else we do. Later in the day, browsing on my mobile device, huge Arsenal fan, big into English soccer. There you go, Gunners. Great weekend last week. Um, in, my app, in an app, and then later that night, watching one of my favorite YouTube stars do some celebrity chef cooking thing that I didn't do very well either. But you know, in, in that quick story, uh, which is, I would say, a fairly typical story, maybe outside the running shoes, um, of me, we, we learned something kind of interesting. We both learned something about me as an, as an individual, and we also have a breakout of the fact that these signals came from desktop search, we saw mobile search, we saw in-app, we saw um, video, and it really creates these powerful signals. The wealth of data, again, just to continue to reiterate this point is, is immense. What we're looking at here is the graph of quick recipes searched over the past couple years, which represents a query every 90 seconds. In a simple comparison to healthy recipes, we learn two things immediately, right? One is that people are much more interested in healthy recipes, or really want to be much more interested in healthy recipes, at least. 
Um, and second, we, we see clear seasonality here, right? This is spikes the beginning of the year every year before we slowly get less and less healthy until Christmas and no one's really looking it up. Um, and like the downward trend over time is slightly worrying. So come on guys, let's get it together. But that's just on search. And we have all those powerful signals across platforms that we have inventory available for. And so for the next couple of pieces, I want to take a really deep dive into our target audience that we're looking at here to get a sense of what, what's possible. So what we're going to define here for the next two or three pieces is family focus. So people who are regularly looking up things about their family, activities for their extended family, bar mitzvahs, quinceaneras, things like that. Um, that we also then identify as parents in California, specifically in the lower 50% household income groups, zip codes, compared to all Californians generally. What we see is that this group is heavily female, heavily younger, right? So right off the bat, I think from my work with organizations like all of yours in this room, um, this is something that I, I hear from you, so at the very least helps bolster things we might already know. But let's take a little bit more, right? Just the demographic profile is sometimes not enough to get a sense of what our audience really is about. This is on a look at now what they're interested in online. And all of a sudden, we see it more and more stories start to form. What I'm, we have that family focus piece at the top just to check ourselves, make sure that the data that we're, we're um, producing is, is clean and all that, all that good jazz. Um, we're seeing things pop. I'm, I'm seeing people who like media, game show, reality, social media, that sort of stuff. I'm um, seeing some quick food. I'm seeing food, but fast, right? 30 Minute Chefs, Shopaholics, um, Bargain Hunters, all that jazz. And this is where most organizations that I work with stop. They say, all right, we know our demographic, we know it's um, young, it lives in these areas, and it's really into 30 minute food, like that's where we're gonna go from here, we're just gonna go from there. We really have the ability to go one level beyond and I think really speaks to where the industry is going. So I spent a little bit of time doing what I call a cluster analysis, I don't really have a better word for it, but as audience cohort analysis sometimes it's called. And you know, stepping outside of Google for a second, really when I see campaigns work really well in, in this role in my previous life in grassroots organizing, speaking to an individual and how they perceive their own identity is the way, the, when work is done the best in my opinion. And stepping back into Google, you know, we can definitely help with this work. The machine learning capabilities from these signals that have been created over the past even three or four years have gotten us to the point where we can apply like cutting edge machine learning capability and tools and resources um, to be able to create these different segments. And you know, some of these you see overlapping pieces here, right? And so I think the really important thing is in our research, these groups of individuals see themselves as entirely differentiated where if we just went to do an outreach strategy around people who you know maybe eat unhealthy food and live in a certain area we'd be missing a very critical element of self-identification that's very important for campaigns from public health to public advocacy really just to get just a quick note just to see how we the the way that we actually get this information is the exact same way you would do your outreach and so look for ads on top of google search we have um, inventory across apps and websites and as well as on pre-rolled youtube videos of course platforms that we own all connects in the back end together uh both in the collection and, and outreach that you guys are doing okay so we have our audience, we develop our strategy, we're starting to do our, our, our outreach in general. How do we know that it's working? I think one of the most challenging things in our space is, is that the, you know, the results come in a very long increments, right? We have to wait six months at the very least for a study to wrap up, maybe a couple years for a longitudinal study. Um, so Google can, can, uh, comes to this challenge uh, in, in two ways, at the very least while you're actually doing the outreach. Um, one with a search lift piece and one with a brand lift piece. And essentially what this is, is once you've ID'd your total audience, let's say cohort one from the previous slide, we withhold about 20 to 30% of that group from seeing your message, and then we ask them a one question survey to get a sense of what is this person saying. Uh, so we can ask questions around behavior intent, recall, favorability. Um, so questions we've run in the past is, are you going to smoke next week? Are you, do you in the next 30 days, uh, are you going to eat f healthy foods? Are you going to drink water, right? We want to look for the relative differences between these groups because we want to know how they're responding themselves. I would also argue that looking at search lift, which I'll get to a little bit later, if you do your outreach to a group of individuals that then, that has never really done much search activity on Google around healthy diet or healthy food, 
And then they go and they start searching those recipes. They start searching um, behaviors, characteristics they previously had not had. Oftentimes, in the immediate sense, at the very least, that is as close as we can get to behavior change. And so search is a behavior, search is an action, and in that way, uh, I think that we can provide very powerful capabilities to know if you're hitting the mark or not as you get going. This is just a quick piece on how it literally looks. If any of you have been on YouTube and seen this one question survey before, this is what somebody's doing. Um, and uh, what, you know, I, I've run about 80 or 90 of these, and just looking at the ones specifically focused on behavior intent, Typically, when you do outreach, there is a measurable impact, right? And just to get a sense that we do see statistical significance in this, that we do see areas that you can um, break out and, and really deep dive into whether your strategy is working or not. This is similar also with advocacy and election campaigns, if you're going that route or more from public health. Um, I think this is largely due to creative differences. As sometimes the federal government, at the very least, creative isn't really as good as, as the advocacy pieces that we've seen here. Um, we can get some interesting data cuts here and then really honing in on that last point that we, being good researchers, we want to make sure that on the one hand, people are self-responding to things that uh, our campaign is trying to promote and, uh, and then they're actually going and doing that, right? They're actually going to Google and searching that activity. And really, if there's three things to take away from my piece here in my small segment today, um, is that the, really the digital revolution, the mobile revolution has, has created an insane uh, volume of information to, for you to utilize, to push the message, and really get the, the um, how and when correct. Uh, and that Google can help you with that in a number of ways. Uh, and please find me to talk to me. This is my first conference. Thank you so much. way down. Hi everybody, my name is Diana. I'm with Twitter's government and advocacy team and thank you so much for having me today. Um, as Quinn mentioned, we've talked a lot about policy today and I'm going to be talking about the messaging around the policy that you've heard about specifically on Twitter. So before I get started, I know many of you in the room are aware of what Twitter is, but I want to get to the nuts and bolts of exactly who we are and where we're going before I dive into the public health aspect of Twitter. So Twitter has been known uh, in the past few years as many different things. We've been known as a water cooler, we've been known as a megaphone, we've been known as a social media platform, but most recently, uh, Twitter's really defined itself as what's happening. We are a news source. People come to Twitter in a discovery mindset uh, because news breaks 15 minutes faster on Twitter than anywhere else. So people can come to Twitter when news breaks and they know that they're going to see what happens on Twitter before any other platform, any other news source. So we've really defined ourselves as what's happening and we're really proud of that. So before I dive, as, as I mentioned before I dive in, I want to give you a sense of what's been happening on Twitter and in the world in the last few months. Okay, a very quick recap of the last few months on Twitter. Um, but as I mentioned, it's what's happening, and that's our beacon and our north star for everything that we're doing right now on Twitter. Uh, so just diving into public health and Twitter. 
Um, it's something that we're really proud of and that we do a lot of here uh, at, at Twitter. And so what we've done is recently we did a, uh, a study with Fin Futures, and we talked to respondents about how they feel social media impacts public policy outcomes. And one of those big policy pieces was healthcare. And so this spoke to Facebook and Twitter, um, Instagram, and those were some of the social media pieces that we talked to these respondents about. And you'll see here that 79% of these respondents felt that social media played a very large impact on their general uh, public policy. And so this really talks to the fact that social media is a huge component of advocacy and public policy. And so I think this is important when you're talking about messaging and working on messaging and overarching strategy in your day to day. Uh, speaking specifically to Twitter and health, um, so we have 10 million people seeking to be healthy that are using Twitter. And so when you're talking about fitness and you're talking about, I'm sorry, uh, talking, 10 million people who are seeking to be healthy on Twitter. So when you're talking about fitness and you're talking about eating healthier, these people are coming to Twitter, as I mentioned, coming to Twitter in a discovery mindset. So they're trying to find new ways to be healthy and they're using Twitter to do so. And when you're talking about, you know, the overall online uh, online media, um, that's one in every five users online who are actually using Tweety Twitter as that medium. Um, and I think a differentiator for Twitter is that trends are actually unfolding on Twitter as well. So I think the really interesting way to use our platform is to find out when something is going to happen and when something is going to break. And for, for health specifically, uh, conversations unfold. Uh, and a good example of this is the flu. And we also saw this with Zika and we also saw this with Ebola. So you'll see here a conversation trend. This was 2013 through 2015 with the flu outbreaks. So you'll see this conversation spike here with this graph. Um, and this correlated with the actual flu outbreak as reported by the CDC. So if you keep an eye on the conversations happening around topics that are meaningful and valuable to your organizations, you'll see that corresponding just before things actually are, are out, outbreaks or things actually are happening um, in the world, which I think is very powerful for the work that you all are doing in this room. Uh, speaking specifically to obesity and, and the work that you all are doing here, we've seen 14.8 million mentions around healthcare and public health and obesity in the last 30 days. And 14.8 million may not um, seem significant, but we're right in the middle of hockey and the championships. Anybody uh, Nashville or Pittsburgh fans in the room? <laughs> Um, but there were only 6.7 million mentions of hockey and the Stanley Cup in the last 30 days. So the fact that there's over double the conversation volume happening around obesity and healthcare and public health in the last 30 days is incredibly significant. Uh, so talking to your audience, and um, I know we've talked a lot about you know, vulnerable audiences, and I just want to speak to just a few of those here really quickly. So the Hispanic population on Twitter is heavily engaged, and it's a large and growing audience. We have 18 million unique users every month on Twitter, and 46% spend more time on Twitter than non-Hispanic audiences, so they're very much engaged. Um, and 29%, we've seen 29% year-over-year growth of that audience, so it's continually growing. And how they're consuming the content is very important as well. So we see that they're tweeting both in English and in Spanish. Uh, we call this Spanglish. And so I think if you're trying to be authentic in your conversation when you're reaching these audiences, this is a great way to do so. Uh, speaking to the African American audience on Twitter, again, very large, highly influential on our platform. We see about 12 million unique monthly visitors, and 47% spend more time than a non African American audience on Twitter as well. And in terms of total reach, so an audience that is complete in terms of all the digital audiences on Twitter are being reached by our platform. So that's a very large saturation point, something that we're very proud of. So talking to how other departments are, be, are using Twitter effectively and how we're seeing this um, being successfully engaged with in the wild. Um, we've done a study with Nielsen that saw almost 70% of Twitter users have been influenced in their viewpoints by something they saw on Twitter. So everyone here is trying to change the views of how people are you know, exercising, how they're uh, viewing food. 
um, I think it's important to note that Twitter is an effective place to do so. So the CDC does a wonderful job of engaging with users online via Twitter. Uh, the example that I have here is the smoking cessation campaign that they've run. Um, they use targeting very effectively. One of the very unique ways you can target to users on Twitter is via TV targeting, where you can target to people watching a particular television program with promoted tweets. Um, and so they did so using the doctors as the television program they targeted with. Um, and they used t uh, video on Twitter, which is the most um, effective way to target to users, an efficient way to target users. Um, and with that, they used a, a man named Sean. And so emotion is a, a very strong way to tug at people's heartstrings uh, via Twitter. Um, and so this man shared his story, um, his, smoking, his smoking story, and they did so with a campaign called Hashtag CDC Tips, where they provided tips to users as to how they could quit smoking. Um, and, and it was a very emotion-driven uh, campaign. Uh, additionally, it's a, a very effective way to drive action. Again, another, uh, another strong goal of many people in the room to actually change perception and drive action of users. So we see a 3.2x lift in conversions, people actually taking an action that are engaging with tweets on Twitter. Um, the New York City Department of Health ran a very successful campaign around Memorial Day where they both tweeted in Spanish and in English. I know we talked about uh, that dual kind of engagement. If you can't do that, I think uh, tweeting both in Spanish and English is also very effective when you're trying to reach a Hispanic audience. Um, and again, they used uh, real live moments such as Memorial Day um, by tweeting around that moment and asking people who are going to the beach with that call to action, going to the beach to tweet to a particular um, uh, a particular um, phone number and to receive alerts in real time about water quality. Um, thank you so much for your time and I'm at Diana C. if you have any further questions. So I'm just gonna wrap us up with some action steps. I liked Lowell's list of four things that he um, is planning to do and the Convergent Partnership um, is planning to do. And I think they'll put up my slide and I'll, I'll show the four that I've been thinking about. I think through this process, each of us, in the way that we work in our communities and our states, in influencing national policy need to think about what our own list is, but I'll give mine as an example. So one of the things we're trying to do in the next four years or three and a half years is to protect the progress that we've already made on food and nutrition, to defend SNAP, school foods, menu labeling, nutrition facts, and protect the dietary guidelines which are coming up from political meddling. Um, the second thing that I have on my to-do list is that no matter who is in charge in Washington, we can still hold industry to account and try to get industry to make changes directly to their products and their practices, like redu reducing junk food marketing to kids, reducing portion size, sodium, added sugars, and otherwise reformulating and making their products better, removing unsafe additives. We can blow the whistle on deceptive advertising and labeling. Holding the industry to account is especially important during this administration with, um, who is not gonna be focused on um, government oversight and making sure that industry does the right thing. It's mostly gonna be looking out for industry in interest and how they can most help them. The third thing is to look for opportunities where we can. So at the national level, there may be policy opportunities that come up as there were during the Bush administration. And there's still a lot we can do at the state and local level. During the Bush years, that was one of the times I was probably busiest and most effective during my time at CSPI. I worked with folks here in California and around the country to pass over 20 menu labeling bills. We worked with many of you on school foods policies at the state and local level. Mike and others at CSPI worked on limits on trans fat in the food supply, all of which built to the major national policies that we were able to achieve very early in the Obama administration. We had those things lined up, ready to go, so that when the time came in Washington, we were ready 
to make sure that we could translate that momentum into lasting national policy. And then the fourth thing is, I think, would be similar to Lowell's innovation of, we need to lay the groundwork for future successes. Thinking about what's next and where we're going to have to work for many years to lay policy. Most of the national policies that I've worked on have taken over a decade. And so we need to begin the work on those now, laying the groundwork for change. Because I know that I am going to be in DC a lot longer than Donald Trump. <laughs> So if we can stand together, we can resist, and we can make sure that our voices are heard to keep the country from going backwards, to protect our kids, to stand up for low-income families and for vulnerable communities. And we will persist. We are going to be at this for a while, and we will continue to make progress. So a few ways to get involved. So many of you are working on policy in your day job and have the opportunity to make change. For those of you who aren't, there are still lots of ways that you can make a difference in your spare time. I see an audience with a lot of women. We are usually very busy. We have full-time jobs. We have children. We have homes. We have lots of things to take care of. But even just spending a little bit of time, you can make a difference. And folks like you around the country have been essential and core to all of the policy successes that we have had at the Center for Science and the Public Interest, and I think that we have had as a country. So one thing you can do is join a coalition. Um, I manage the National Alliance for Nutrition and Activity, which is a has about 500 national, state, and local organizations that work together on nutrition, physical activity, and obesity policy. But there are many other effective coalitions around the country. Lori and I work together on the Food Marketing Work Group on junk food marketing to kids. Join a state coalition, join a local coalition. Coalitions are a great way to make a difference because together, I think each one of our voices matters, but together, we can be much louder, and when we have synergy between our actions, they're even more effective. Get connected online. You heard that um, a lot today. Um, we at CSPI and other organizations have online action networks that make it super easy for you to get engaged. If you follow CSPI, join CSPI's action network, we will let you know when are key times to weigh in on national policy who you should contact, give you some talking points or a model email that you can send. If you don't join CSPI's email action network, join somebody else's. Public health advocates, many other organizations around the country have similar email action networks which make it very easy to act. Um, I'm gonna ask you to act right now, right? We're talking about action, let's see what we can do together. So get out your phones, get out your tablets, your laptop, and um, I'm going to ask you to tweet. Um, I gave you two tweeting options. Some of you may be worried about lobbying. Neither one of them is lobbying. One is a tweet at the, um, the secretary of USDA, Sonny Perdue, asking him not to roll back the progress on school nutrition. If you want to go to my Twitter feed, at Margo Wutan, very easy. You can just retweet me or you can type this in, use the hashtag for the conference, and it'll come up on your conference app. But again, it's not lobbying if you're worried about that. This is administrative action. It's not about a specific law or bill, so um, your lawyers will tell you it's okay. Um, if you feel more comfortable tweeting at a company or you wanna tweet both, um, you can tweet at Chili's, asking them to take soda and other sugary drinks off the menu. We have partnered with a number of groups in the Food Marketing Work Group and have convinced McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's, Jack in the Box, and about a half a dozen major chain restaurants to take soda off the children's menu. But we still have a lot of work to do, and Chili's is um, next in our sites, and so we'd like them to join these other companies to um, make change. Follow a group 
that you like, that you believe in on Facebook, on Twitter, and they'll provide information and background and opportunities to regularly get involved in action, and it does work. I was telling Diana before about an example. During the Super Bowl, our friends at Taco Bell um, ran an ad that said, don't bring vegetables to the football party. They, all your friends will think you are very uncool. Bring a box of tacos instead. Vegetables uncool, tacos very cool. So we launched a Twitter campaign um, on a Sunday morning, and by 5 o'clock that night, Mike heard from a very high-level executive at Taco Bell telling us that they would take the ad down. So, so it can and does work with policymakers, with companies, and others. So, um, so I would encourage you to tweet today, let's all together make our voices heard so that Chili's and Secretary Purdue can't ignore us. And I think, lastly, I would just say, you know, that it's okay to be angry. I think in these days, if you're not angry, maybe you're not watching the news, um, <laughs> which isn't maybe necessarily a bad thing to do. But when I channel my anger into action, I feel so much better, less stress, more productive. It just gives me an outlet for it. And so this session and this conference are a really good time to come together, to get recharged, to think about how we're going to deal with nutrition, obesity, and physical activity policy in the next several years, how we can work together to make a difference, and that together we can improve the food environment and make it possible for all Americans to eat well and to protect their family's health. Thank you. Oh, I see a few retweets on my phone, but I need a couple of more. So why don't we open it up for questions? You'll see microphones. It's a little hard to see. There's kind of a cross here in the front. And um, we have some time for questions. Three questions? Three minutes. Oh, so you better hurry up to the microphone. Okay. So, um, so we've had some questions come in for, for Diana and Quinn about how would you recommend people use the information say, for example, the Google Analytics to help support their nutrition promotion campaign? Sure. I think it's on. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right, cool. Yeah, so it's a, it's a really good question. There is a, a bunch of different free tools. I think the Google suite of products is really is sort of like the Photoshop of outreach that you can kind of cobblestone, cobble it in, a, in, a, in any way that really makes sense for you. Um, Google Analytics is just to answer the direct question is a tool that looks at the different areas of people coming to your website and so it's a little snippet of code you put on your website gives you a platform to analyze information coming in really it depends on the question I would say you should start with a question you're trying to answer uh, and so if you're trying to answer who is coming here there's a section on the site that breaks out by demographic that breaks out by the interests segments that I just went over um, if you're trying to look at is somebody filling out like a form on my website, then there's another piece of information you can, you can do to drive to a specific action. And then just sort of work backwards. What is the website, like the landing page that's leading someone to fill out a form? What is the color scheme that works better than another one? All that sort of information on a website level filters in. Uh, and then Google Trends is, is a really great way. Uh, it was a free tool on search activity that I also showed that can help you check the assumptions that you have of people coming to your website versus the general population in your state or in your uh, DMA local, local area. Yeah, and um, to echo Quinn's point, I think the first thing you need to start out doing is to find out what your goals are, um, whether that is to increase your followers. I know me and Michael had that conversation earlier, um, and that is somewhat of a, a vanity 
uh, metric, but it really adds credibility to your organization. You know, other users and organizations are looking at how many followers you have on Twitter. Um, and so that's a good place to start. It's a good place to, um, you know, find other accounts and organizations that are like-minded and follow them and put out really timely, newsworthy content to gain followers. So that's a good place to start. Um, we also have free analytical tools that are right there on your account, on your Twitter account, uh, and you can find them there. Um, and then really go right from there. You can um, add in just some small dollar amounts and target users um, in many different ways based on your goals, whether that be to drive website clicks to websites that are meaningful to you. Um, you can add engagements on your content. Um, you can add leads, lead generation. Um, and things of that nature. So it really just depends on what your goals are. But everything is right in your Twitter account. Um, you can, it takes you to a dashboard where you can find analytics that Quinn mentioned, similar to Google. Um, and so that's, that's where your best bet is to start. Viva, can I ask you a question? So there are so many threats to low-income families. You know, cuts to health care, Medicaid, SNAP, TANF. How do we work with organizations that are representing low-income families and, and communities at risk? Um, how does nutrition, physical activity, and obesity fit in at these very difficult times? Yeah, I think, let me see here. Is this on? Is it on? OK, great. So it's a good question. Thanks. I appreciate the opportunity to answer. I, I think what's at the root of this question is the fact that all of these programs are supporting vulnerable community residents because of the poverty. So we have to work at addressing the poverty, right? And I think when we think about the intersection of food access and infrastructure to promote physical activity to help reduce um, obesity and prevent childhood obesity, that we have to look at the intersection of our interventions in helping to create economic development, address poverty, build the capacity of those vulnerable community residents to be advocates for, um, for themselves. So one example um, that we've been doing at Cultiva La Salud is we have a small pilot project where we are actually helping um, create micro business opportunities for low income residents. So they will be the purveyors of healthy food through mobile vending carts in food desert neighborhoods. So we're addressing the, the public health problem of having limited access to healthy foods because the community is, is doing the work, right? Like they're benefiting from it. Mm -hmm. So I think it's examples like that. Um, we've worked in Fresno to unlock school gates, and now we're engaging youth and residents to be those recreation leaders. And so these are small employment summer opportunities that help, you know, get money in their pockets, as well as um, working with them to address the, the issues that are facing in their neighborhoods and their communities. So before, I, um, before we thank our panels, I'm going to turn it over to Pat Crawford, who has a special presentation to make. Good morning, everybody. I get to end this wonderful panel with a wonderful award. And I'm wanting you to know right now that there was nothing, not even a big cement truck, that could keep me away from doing it this morning. So here I am. And it is my, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, it is my great honor to award the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Childhood, the Ninth Child, Biennial Childhood Obesity Conference to Michael Jacobson. <laughs> Not yet. Michael is a microbiologist. I'm going to tell you a little bit more on why we did this. 
He's a microbiologist in his training. He's an advocate. He's a public health hero. In my mind, he's Superman. <laughs> um, how did a microbiologist come to start an organization like he started, the Center for Science in the Public Interest? I told him this morning, I love the title of his organization because it really says what it is that they do and what they do is so powerful and it is so amazingly useful. And he was not even 30 years old when he did it. He said, well, I worked with Ralph Nader and I got some ideas and colleagues and I, you know, he, before industry was such a huge problem that we have now where we're working at opposite goals and the uh, diets of Americans have really, um, uh, you know, faced incredible risk from the food supply that, that is around us all the time. But before that, he had the vision to set up an organization that would provide the research and the science that could counter the claims that were being made and would be made in the future. And, and they have tackled the the chemicals in our food, the um, additives, the food dyes, the, the types of fats, I mean, solely taking on trans fats, which were really a killer in our food supply, saving hundreds and thousands of people from, uh, from the damages of, of, of foods that are so you know, uh, bad for us. Right now, he's already, uh, once again, suing the FDA because of all the chemicals that are in our food supply that haven't been tested. So, and if that weren't enough, I mean, all the work he's done with fast food, he coined the word junk food. I had no idea that, you know, what a powerful thing that he did. Also empty calories, things that we use all the time. Michael has really been, I mean, he has had, um, he has had our back. He produces a, um, uh, uh, here, I'm going to see if I can show you. This Nutrition Action newsletter comes out of CSPI that many of you have seen that have all kinds of information. So not only is he an advocate and does the science, the research, but he communicates it. Um, it, it they did the liquid candy, you know, moving the whole field towards understanding what sodas and the ravages that can be on our health. But this is one of my favorites, and you should all be looking for it. He says what the worst foods are. The organization takes on the worst foods and the best foods, and they name names, and they really hold industry accountable. So all this time, CSPI has really had our back, and I, for one, am so eternally grateful. And Michael has been the leader of this organization, and he is just the brilliance, the compassion, the the um, the the efforts that he has put on our behalf is just un, uh, it just is unestimable. So I want you all now to give a great big uh, uh, applause for Michael Jacobson, who is our hero. Yeah, you can come up. But, and here it is. <laughs> I didn't know if I could give it. So it, it says from our conference, and we hope that he will use it and remember us and continue the great work that he's doing. So. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Pat. I promise I will not fill this with soda pop. I will. <laughs> great. And, um, uh, I don't have a speech because, nope, no speech. <laughs> but I did want to thank, you know, it wasn't I alone. There were three of us who set up Center for Science in the Public Interest, and all the things you mentioned, we couldn't have done without a terrific staff. You know, I've said enough good things about Margot today, I don't want to embarrass her any further, but Bonnie Liebman uh, and just many other people going back into the 1970s. and. I have to confess, it's been a lot of fun. Okay, great. Okay.
So I'd like to express my thank you to the whole panel. I think it really motivated us, got us started for a fabulous conference. So thank you, Margo, and the rest of the panel. And you are all dismissed. And be sure to hurry and get out of this room uh, because we're going to reset it. But please give another hand of applause to the entire panel. Thank you.